We've had some wonderful testimonies of our Christmas past. But you know, what about our Christmas futures? Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles this morning to John chapter 6. You know, I told Brother Johnny earlier this morning, I said, this isn't going to be a normal Christmas service. Of course, would we really want a normal Christmas service? You know, some of us, we've already had many messages on Christmas and the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is pertaining to that. Believe me that it is. But ultimately this morning, I want to talk about not our future or our Christmas past, but our Christmas futures in Christ Jesus. As I start this morning, I'm going to start in verse 35 of chapter 6 in the book of John, where it says this, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye shall all also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father give me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will that hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to you this morning, we already know that your Spirit, God, has been at work in this service today. Through it from the very beginning of it, through the choir and through the songs, God, we have seen how that your Spirit has been leading and guiding us. Father, we pray that you continue to lead and to guide us into all truth and righteousness for thy name's sake. And Father, this morning that we might hear what the Spirit has to say to us. God, that we can better do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as I read that, that verse 38 says, For I came down from heaven. Do you know in the song that I sang you there a little bit ago, it says, I came, and you came down from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, and from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. That's what we as Christian believers need to be doing in a lost and a dying world is proclaiming the name of Jesus without being ashamed and unabashedly that we might stand forth for the truth. Because this is why that Jesus came was to save sinners from hell. To save souls that we might come to know Him in a real and a personal way. And yet, we so many times today see the world going in the opposite direction and doing everything that it can to come against Christianity. But we need to understand, this is what Christmas is really all about. The world may be celebrating Christmas today because they don't understand the true meaning of what it is. But yet it is this, that He came down from heaven to do the will of the Father that He give His life as a ransom for us sinners. John 3, 16 and 17. Turn with me there if you would. We have several scriptures to go through today. But I want you to know that God's love, He loved us so much, He was willing to go the extra mile. Do you realize that there was no other way for us to obtain salvation except God pay the price for us. In fact, whenever that John went to heaven and that he saw the revelation of Jesus Christ and was allowed to see that, and there came the time to when they looked in the heavens 
and they looked in the earth. They looked everywhere for someone that was worthy, and yet no one was found worthy to loose the seals. And John said, I wept. Oh, to God that we might have weeping within our eyes because we have a passion of an understanding of what the gospel is all about. And John began to weep. And as he began to weep, one of the angels or one of the men came up to him and said, Weep not, for the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to loose the seals. And who is that but Jesus Christ Himself. He came as the Lamb of God, the living Lamb of God. And I want you to know that when He came, He came as that Lamb, but He is coming again as a Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is coming as a warrior to lead in battle, to lead in war. And He's going to lead us to truth and to righteousness for those who will stand in Him who believe. But John chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17 says this, the most quoted verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Right there is the gift to where it says that God gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That was even what the angel had told Mary, Joseph, that he was going to be there to save his people from their sin. And he is saving us from our sin because we are his people, because we have accepted him. But for God so loved the world that he gave. That's the true great gift that ought to be under the tree is Jesus. In each and every one of our hearts this morning, we should have that gift underneath our tree. In Matthew, in chapter 2, turning with me back there, we find I'm not going to go through the whole story this morning, but I am going to start in verse 9 of chapter 2 because we see the wise men that came from the east, the far east, that came bearing gifts to Jesus. They had went and they had looked and they had searched they were looking in the Scriptures and actually these were considered magi. And as if they were coming, they were going off of prophecy from the Old Testament in which that they had been looking for and waiting and hastening unto the coming of the Messiah. And as if they were, they went to see Jesus. And in verse 9, and it says, And when they had heard the king, <coughs> excuse me, having a little trouble with my voice, give me grace. And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, a star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. They had been looking, they had been searching, and this star that they were following, it literally led them to where that Jesus was at. Now you can look up in the sky, and you may not see any stars moving, or whatever, but this star moved. According to the scripture, this star, they followed this star, and when it got to where it, it stayed there, because that's where the king of kings was at. That is where that these magi were going to worship and to bring offerings and gifts in verse 11. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down. Now they fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Wow. They came bearing gifts. This wasn't something that you could pick up at Walmart and just simply give to someone else. These were gifts that were given to kings, that were given to royalty. Because they knew who they were coming and they were worshiping. You see, we are not supposed to bow our knee and to worship to anyone except the Lord. Even in the book of Revelation, when you see John, there were times that he fell, he was just so overwhelmed that he fell down in front of angels and up there thought, we're going to worship, I'm going to, I better worship. And it's like, no, the angel said, no, do this not, for I'm just a fellow servant. I'm just a fellow brother of the Lord. Don't worship me. 
Because God is the only one that is to be worshipped. But they came bearing these gifts and they knew who they were worshipping. And they bowed down and they began to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because He was worthy of their worship. I'm excited. I may not have a good voice, but I'm excited. Because I believe this. If we believe this this morning, it should change our lives. It should change the way that we live. It should change the way that we treat our fellow humanity. Whether saved or unsaved, we should treat them the same way that Jesus Himself would treat them. To love our enemies. To do good unto them. It's easy to do good to those who simply do good to you. Try doing something good to somebody who hates you. And the Scriptures tell us you'll heap coals of fire upon their head. But it'll be to the glory of the Lord because you'll be acting like your Master. Turn with me if you would to Colossians in chapter 1. You see in Colossians in chapter 1 we find out how that Jesus is actually spoken here in the first chapter I'm going to start to read in verse 12 because this is how that we should really do and be giving thanks unto the Father <laughs> which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Do you realize that we are partakers of the saints in light? Because those that have gone on, those that have already entered in to His presence through the passing of life. We too shall enter into that if we tarry long enough. But I believe it's possible that we're just going to be raptured out of here. Don't know when. Don't know, but I'm believing in my heart that it's close. Whether it is or whether it's not. And whether I die in this life or whether that I'm translated at that time. We need to maintain the faith. Verse 13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Woo! I'm going to read that one again. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Into the kingdom of the Son of the living God in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of every creature? I want to say something here. Who is the image of the invisible God whenever that in John chapter 14, you know, in fact, just go back there with me. John chapter 14. I hadn't planned on doing this, but we're going to do it anyhow. John chapter 14, verse 5. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the, I, I said unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father. It sufficeth us. And Jesus said unto him, have I been so long with time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip, that he that he that hath seen me hath seen the Father? And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? You see, if you've seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. That's why the Word is so important. Go back over there to Colossians. So there in verse 15 to where that it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by Him were all things created that were in heaven and that were in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. Wait. I thought Jesus was born 2,000 years ago. No, no. Jesus has always been because He has always been with the Father. The Scripture says that He came out of the bosom of the Father. 
He was not created. He came out of the Father, the bosom of the Father, because He is a part of the Godhead. Amen. Jesus is just as much a part of God as the Father is, as the Holy Ghost is. Because these three are one. When you've seen Jesus, you've seen God the Father. When you've seen God the Father, you've seen God the Son. Because they are one. Jesus talks about this in the Scriptures. And here this time at Christmas, whenever that we celebrate His birth, He was only born into humanity to be able to come into the natural realm from the supernatural realm in which He came. Do you understand that? Amen. He came from a supernatural realm to a natural realm to save us because He loves us. Amen. If people could get that, they would begin to understand. They've got to trade their thoughts for God's thoughts. That's why the world is in the shape that it is today because they're going by their own thoughts and by the thoughts that the devil is placing in their mind. And you know what? They're doing a pretty good job because the Christians aren't standing up the way that we should to proclaim the name of Jesus. I'm not telling you to become radical or fanatical or some weird flipped out Jesus freak. If you want to be, go ahead. Amen. But just stand up for Jesus. Stand up for the Word of God because this world is doing everything that it can to go against the truth of the Word of God which will stand forever. Amen. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my Word will stand forever. Amen. How long is that? Forever! So it's still the same today, yesterday, and forever because I want you to know the world is trying to change the Word of God. It's trying to get the Word of God so far out of its vocabulary. If you speak the Word of God, you're hate speech. You're speaking hate speech. No, you're speaking true speech. And they're trying to silence the truth because the truth shall set you free. It will set you free. Verse 17 of Colossians chapter 1. And He is before all things. And by Him all things consist. I like that word consist. Because all things are held together. If it weren't for Jesus, it's your book. That'd be it. But because Jesus, all things consist by Him or are held together by Him. That's what keeps us together. And He is the head of the body. The church. Who is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. That in all things He might have the preeminence. That He might have first place. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Now who did it please? It pleased the Father. God the Father. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes aliens and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now have, the, have He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable. You can't do that on your own. That can only be done through the blood of Jesus and unreproachable in His sight. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the Gospel, didn't we mention hope earlier today? Didn't we mention hope earlier today? The hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Paul was proclaiming the truth of the word of God that came from the foundations of the scriptures even of the Old Testament for in the book of Genesis, when God looked upon the face of the waters and the deep, it was the Spirit that went out 
whenever that God, Jesus, began to create all things that was going on. And then He said, but yet, He wanted to create man, but He created man in His image. You see, animals are not created in the image of God. You are created in the image of God. I am created in the image of God. And I've got to tell you, Satan hates that. Because God loved us so much that God said, let us make man in our image. But yet God had to send His only begotten Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to cleanse us from our sin. Amen. God did that. God did that through the story of Christmas and how that He did this. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16 says this, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. I like that. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who was that? Jesus. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the Spirit. Who was that? Jesus. Seen of angels. Preached unto Gentiles. Believed in the world. And received up into glory. He was received back up into glory. Now this may not be your traditional Christmas message. Praise God. Amen. Amen. But this is all about Christmas. Amen. This is all about what Jesus has done for us. And not, not only what He has done for us, what He is doing now and continually on throughout eternity for what that He has done in John in chapter 17. If you'll turn with me there. To verse 1 through 5. I'll give you a second to get there. John, oh yes, I do need to make this announcement. Johnny told me, he said, Brother, you just take your liberty today and preach as long as you want. I said, okay, thank you. I do. Of course, you know I'm not going to go over. John chapter 17, starting in verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up His eyes unto heaven and said, now, who was he lifting his eyes up to? The Father. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may be glorified thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You see, it was the Father that sent the Son. It was God the Father who sent the Son. I have glorified thee on the earth, and I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Well, before the world was. I want to tell you, He had so much glory that we cannot even understand that glory. Whenever that Moses wanted to see the Shekinah glory, wanted to see the glory of the Lord, God the Father said, I can't let you see my face, but you know, I'm going to set you in the cleft of the rock, I'm going to put my hand out like that, and as I pass by, I'm going to let you see my hind parts. And when Moses began to see that, the, even the hind parts, the, the trail of the glory of the Lord in that, he had so much of a glow of God on him. When he finally went back to the children of Israel, they couldn't even look at him. They had to put a veil over his face because the glory of God was so bright and shining, they couldn't even look at Moses. What kind of glory? Must Jesus have came from that He's asking the Father, Father, glorify Thou me with the glory that I had before the world was. Wow! Wow! Isn't that awesome? 
Verse 24 of that same chapter says this, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. That's what I want you to get a glimpse of this morning, is a glimpse of the glory of Jesus, the glory of the Lord, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. God the Father loved God the Son before the foundation of the world, and it was Jesus who created those things because He placed it into the hands of the Father. You see, there is proper order in everything, and one does not usurp authority over that which is there, which is rightfully given. Jesus humbled Himself to the obedience, even unto the obedience of death, the death on the cross. And God glorified Him through His humility in that. But I'm also going to give you another scripture. I got time. Go back to John in chapter 14. Many of you know this scripture by heart. But yet, you see, we are looking. You see, we are celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ today. His first advent into this world. But yet, there is another advent, the second advent, which is to come. The second coming of the Lord and Jesus gives us this promise in John chapter 14 to where that He said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. For who? For you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. I'm going to read that verse 3 again. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. You know what? I want to be right at the feet of Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. And He is preparing that place for us. For the last 2,000 years, He's been preparing that place. He's already prepared that place when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Amen. Layman's terms, it's done. It's a done deal, Lord. Because He was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Amen. And it's done. It's finished. As Marilyn comes to the piano this morning, for the last verse is in Revelation in chapter 22. And this is what I've really been feeling like that the Lord has been wanting is to prepare His people. Prepare for His coming. Sherry, thank you so much for sharing what you did this morning in testimony because it's important that we be obedient to act on what God puts on our hearts. Everybody looks at me and they think, oh, it's so easy for you. No, it's really not. It is to a point, but yet I have to submit myself to that obedience. I have to submit myself even to authorities that are over me. When we went and did that revival here a couple of weeks ago, you know, we did the music and we did all that, but yet whenever that it was time for the pastor of that church to come up, I bowed and went back and stood my place because I was in submission to Him and His congregation because He was the authority in that place. Whenever that we see we need to be in submission to our leadership, we need to be in submission to the Spirit of God, and when God leads us into those places that we need to speak out, let us speak out, but let it be with humbleness and humility before the Lord that it is truly God and not ourselves. The last scripture for today is in Revelation in chapter 22, starting in verse 12, and these are in the letter read. The words of Jesus to where He said, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his works shall be. 
I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have rights to the tree of life and may enter through the, the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and adulterers and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. If that doesn't sound like a message right from Jesus' lips this morning, I don't know what it is. But on this Christmas morning, as we celebrate His birth, let us also celebrate the knowledge of knowing that His coming is soon and very soon. Because just as that those magi were waiting in anticipation to see that star, to be led by the Spirit, to go and to see the Christ child, so are we today in anticipation, in the waiting for our Lord and Savior, who has told us He's coming, and that He's coming soon. May not be tomorrow, may not be next week, it may not be next year. No man knows the day or the hour. But blessed are those who are waiting for His appearing. Amen. Let our hearts be challenged today on this Christmas morning that we will serve Him to a greater capacity in our personal lives because we have been touched by Him today. Brother Chris. Would you please stand with me as we sing the invitation again, 244. Okay, now I have to make it. I think this stuff's sort of weird because it didn't make it from March. But do not. We'll see what happens. I hope everybody's having a very glorious day. This is such a special day. Okay, it was the night before Jesus came, and all through the house, not a creature was praying. No one. The Bibles were laid on the shelf without care in hopes that Jesus would not come there. The children were dressed and crawled into bed, not once ever kneeling or bowing the head. And Mom in her rocker with the baby on her lap, I was watching the late show while I took a nap. And when out of the east, there was such a clutter. I sprang to my to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. When what to my wondering I should appear, but the angels proclaiming that Jesus was here. With a light, with, with a light like the sun sending forth a bright day, I knew in a moment this must be the day. The light in his face made me cover my head. It was Jesus returning like he had said. And though I possessed worldly wisdom and wealth, I cried when I saw him in spite of myself. In the book of life, which he had in his hand, was written the names of every saved man. He spoke not a word as he searched for my name. When he said, it is not here. My head hung in shame. The people whose names had been written with love, he gathered to take them to his Father above. With those who were ready, he rose with a, without a sound, while the rest of us just were left standing around. I fell to my knees. It was too late. I wanted, I waited too long and sealed my fate. I stood and cried as those rose out of sight. Oh, if only I had been ready tonight. 
In the words of this poem, are the meaning is clear. The coming of Jesus is drawn near. There's only one life, and when it comes the last call, we'll find out that the Bible was true after all.